Good morning, guys. I hope that you are doing well. Today, we're going to be discussing chapter two of Physics 101, motion in one dimension. And remind, just as a reminder, this is more of a quick review. We're skipping over the ideas as though they've already been gone over once. Um, but also, it's a little bit of an introduction in case you're new to physics. So let's get right into it. Um, to start things off, I'm going to give a little bit of context so that we understand what motion really is and like what we're dealing with in this chapter and, and the chapters to follow. So in physics, we categorize motion in three types. There is translational, and I have to, I have to mention, I have a brand new marker, brand new marker. You love the smell of that? And look at how it works on the board. Amazing. <laughs> compared to the last, the last video. Mm -mm -mm. So, translational. We also have rotational. And finally, we have vibrational. You might have already heard about all of these, but Let's try and describe these, these different motions, right? And these are the three different types of motion that we can face, right? So basically, translational, a good example of that is, well, a car traveling down the highway. So example, we got a car that's moving. You can see by these little indicators, it is heading in that direction. I can maybe make an arrow. A force diagram is always nice. So it's heading in that direction. And there's a lot of internal forces working on this, this little car. And there's a lot of different motions happening inside. But as a whole, if we just consider the car moving, it is a translational movement, right? Now, rotational is a bit different. An example of rotational could be where the place where we all live, Earth. I guess I can try and make like a America. Oh, that's not very good. <laughs> and there's little islands in the north of Canada. And then we have South America, I'm just gonna make a blob. Here we have Australia, Russia. Okay, there we go. Our planet is actually rotating on itself. That's what makes us see, that's how we see the days and the nights. At some point of the, the day, we are facing the sun. At another point, we are not facing the sun. We're on the other side, and the sun stays over here shining, sending its rays of light. We can't see those rays because we're on the other side. And that turning motion is what we call rotational motion. It's not a turning motion. Yeah, it's specifically a rotational motion. Ooh, what's going on here? It's all right, I'll fix that later. And finally, we have vibrational. This might be a little bit counterintuitive, but a good example of a vibrational movement is a pendulum moving back and forth. It's heading, it's movement, it's back and forth movement is what we call a vibration, right? And in this and the next few chapters, we will only be considering translational motion. It's only this one. Later on, in the course, you're definitely going to work with rotational movement. And we're, and we're actually going to work with vibrational as well. Uh, these pendulums, I wouldn't necessarily... Cons yeah, I, I mean, I guess we're going to sometimes discuss vibrational movement, but we're mainly going to deal with translational and rotational movement motion in this class. But for now, we will only be talking about translational movement. In our study of translational motion, we will use what is called the particle model, and describe the moving object as a particle regardless of its size. So 
even though this is a car, we're just gonna say that it's a point and it's heading in this direction. Not only will that simplify things, but um, yeah, it will basically simplify things and it will help us um, avoid considering a lot of um, details that would make physics very difficult to warm up to. We need to start somewhere. And so a particle is like a point-like object um, that is an object that has a mass but is of infinite, infinitely, infinitesimal size. I always mess up that word. So it's extremely small, but it does have a mass. And that's what we're going to work with for the next few chapters. And we're going to call that the particle model. Right? All right. That's great. Next, we will begin to discuss position. What is position? Well, it's basically where something is at a given moment in time. And this will be the basis for so much to come in our class. Position. Very, very basic and fundamental notion. I need to take a sip of water. All right, so when we study the motion of an object, the most important quantity is the position of the object. And we can, let's define this actually. The definition of position that we'll be using, and we won't need to define it a lot, this is just a way to pinpoint what it is exactly, is the location of an object in space with respect to a coordinate system. And that last bit is very important. Actually, all of it's important, but let's not forget that last part. With respect to a coordinate system. All right, so let's start things off by define. We've started things off by just defining it. The location of an object in space with respect to a coordinate system. Note that we're working in one dimension. So an example of such a scenario of, of like an example that can help us picture this is like I said before, same example that I gave for the for the translational notion, it's just a car driving down the highway. Bang, let's do a quick little drawing. So we can at least see it's a car. All right, so we have a car and we're actually going to measure it. So it's on a coordinate system, right? And we're working in one dimension. So we will be working with the x-axis. And that x-axis will be measuring how many meters it's traveled, or not actually how many meters it's traveled, just how many meters away from the initial, from our zero it is in its travels, where, however fast, however um, slow it might be going. So let's set a few different milestones along this measurement, instru this instrument. We got one, two, three, four, five, and six. All right. So if we consider this to be x equals zero, and remember we're working with the particle model. So basically this, though I've drawn this car as a whole, we're going to try to summarize it with just a point so that things are a little bit di more digestible. So let's say that this is the point where it is. Well, in that case, ask yourself, well, where is it along this line? What position does it have? What is, what is the location of the object with respect to the coordinate system? 
Well, if we consider this to be zero, x equals zero, then the car is actually at one meter away from the startup, the, from the zero, zero. Well, well, in this case, just the zero. And that's, that's basically how we um, determine the distance between two things. Let's say that there's like something else over here, like a ball. Well, then it's one meter away from the ball. Okay, that's a little bit irrelevant. Um, another very important notion is that position is a function of time, right? Position is a function of time. And we're actually going to be writing the function of position like this. X of t, where x is the position, as I've shown here, and t is the time that has elapsed, right? So at x, at t is equal to 3, the car is likely going to be at a different location. At t is equal to 7, 7 seconds, I suppose. Um, x is going to be another value, depending on wherever the, the car is in its travels. So, um, and let's note that plotting position versus time is useful. Just as in math, when you were plotting f of x, you would consider, well, first of all, f of x altogether is equal to x, right? Uh, to y, I'm sorry. So that would be our vertical axis. And then x being the dependent variable, the independent variable, I'm sorry, would be the horizontal axis. Well, in this situation, time is independent of wherever the car is. The car, well, at least the position of the car, is dependent on the time that has elapsed. It'll change depending on what point in time we are. So because of that, we will be using t as a horizontal axis and y, not y, I'm sorry, x, as our vertical axis, right? And before we go into that, one final point I forgot to make was that our coordinate system can be whatever we want it to be. It doesn't need to be this exactly. We could create a new coordinate system where we have zero, one, two, three, Four. And if you take a look at this coordinate system, x is actually equal to 2 meters. And so you see everything is relative to the coordinate system. It depends on how, where we're defined, like what the axes are of the situation. Oh, I'm on low power mode. My phone, I'm, I'm filming this with my iPhone. Quick sip of water. Okay, so. Yeah, everything is relative to the coordinate system. That's why establishing a coordinate system in physics problems is very important, just as it is important to define a system, for example. We need to have an understanding of the scenario, not just solve with the formulas by just plugging and chugging. No, that's not how physics works. So, um, we are gonna continue by discussing a little bit Finding out what we can use the t position versus time graph for, right? I'm just going to plug in my iPhone. It's a little low on battery. All right, there we go. Perfect. So, the position versus time graph, right? We're all done with this. We can go ahead and erase what we have. We're still dealing with position, only we're going to be de dealing with it, dealing with its graph with respect to time. Position 
versus time graph, right? And we're going to use the graphs a lot in this class. This is only the beginning. All right. Say we have the following T and we have X, X is in meters, T is in seconds, and we have stamps like this. Bang, 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 bang. All right. Here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten. Two. Let me do jumps. I'm gonna write all of these. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Two, four, six. Fantastic. So, what if we had a graph like this? And there was something plotted, only it was just a straight line. How odd. Mm -hmm. So what is this defining? What is this, what is this graph telling us? Where we see that the position of an object is defined over here. And as time changes, the object, the object will move with respect to the coordinate system, right? So that coordinate system that we saw over there, like this, it's basically like this right now. And it's going to, it's, the, the car will change its position depending on what point in time we are. So in this situation, its position is x equals five. Let me write that over here x is equal to 5 meters and the thing is that it's always x equals 5 what this means is say this is a car it is stationary it's not moving it's at x equals 5 permanently it's not going to move as you see with time nothing changes so basically it's a car that's just in a parking lot not moving nothing to see here so a way that we can say that is the object is stationary. Stationary, right? Okay. Now we're gonna have a few different types of scenarios though when we are working with time um, position versus time graphs not always going to be as simple as that. Sometimes we're gonna have things like this. And I'm gonna start it from zero, zero, just for the sake of it. But sometimes it could start at different other, at other points. Say we have this, what does this mean? Well, if you take a look, um, the object started at x equals zero meters and gradually goes all the way up to like, eight meters away from where it started huh okay and it moves as time changes right as time changes it moves in the positive x direction right and we could have this could have been we could have defined this coordinate system differently but in this scenario this is basically the object moving in the positive x direction all right and this is what we could call forwards mm -hmm. and it's all relative to the coordinate system this could be a very different coordinate system and we'd have a very different understanding of what's going on so another type of situation that we will often see is where 
the graph is going downwards. And in this situation, we, the object will be moving in the negative x direction, which is backwards. Sorry about that. Which we will call backwards. So basically, um, in this situation, the object is moving in the negative x direction. So if we had like a timeline over here, not a timeline, but a measurement of distance, one, two, three, if the point was over here, if an object was over here, then it would be going in this direction, since that is the negative, the negative direction for this coordinate system. Moving forwards is this direction. Right? So it all depends on how we define the coordinate system. Okay. Next, we have a more complicated situation. Right. This looks very scary, and we need to understand what is going on. So, basically, if we use what we understood in the last, what we, what we learned in the last few minutes, this, since it's going upward, since the slope is positive, up until this moment, the object is heading in the positive x direction. Then, from this point on to this point, it will be heading in the negative x direction. And note that this, the crossing of this point, is just um, a return to uh, the original startup point, since we start at zero. It doesn't mean anything, not much more than that. This is just a downward, a, a movement in a negative x direction followed by a movement in the positive x direction over here, and another movement in the negative direction. So an example of like what's going on could maybe be, you're going to school, you head to school, school, and this is your home, zero is your home, and then you realize you forgot your backpack, so you head back home to, let's call this like negative, Five. This is not home. You head. You go to. No, actually, you're at home. You go to school, and you realize you don't have any pencils. So I suppose it's weird of a solution. This is. You go to the store far away, past your home. You go to the store to buy some. After which you return back. Um, you return. Um, you pass your home again on your way to school, and then you realize you want to eat something, so you stop at the grocery market. And note that you're passing home in this situation and this situation. And that's pretty much it. Um, this is just a an object moving back, forwards and backwards, and forwards and backwards, right? And the first time it moves very far in one direction, then it moves very much far in the other direction um, and even passes its starting point. Then it heads back to its starting point, passes a little bit and starts going backwards a little bit behind its starting point. And that's, that repetition is what is happening over here. All right, okay. And another very important concept for position is displacement. We will define this as delta x, right? So delta x is equal to x final minus x initial. Displacement is basically the distance 
the final distance, well, actually just the change in distance, that's what delta is, the change in something, in this case it will be of x, which is our unit of distance, of length. So, not our unit, our measurements of length. Um, so basically, if you head to, you get, head to school, head back to a store, go to the grocery store, blah, 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 and end up straight on x equals zero, we have x initial is equal to zero meters over here, x final is equal to zero meters, thus the delta x is equal to zero meters, since final minus initial, zero minus zero is zero, right? Um, give, let's say, hold on, let me, if I wrote that, yeah, so an example, let's, another, let's check another example out. If we, so if we're dealing with a situation where the initial point of the So basically, if we have, um, so one other remark is that if the graph does not start at zero, zero, not to panic, that just means that the, the object starts at x equals two, and then starts moving in the positive the x direction, or starts moving in the negative x direction. The important is, the important about displacement, though, is that regardless, the displacement does not care about the journey. It only cares about the end point. Say we end over here. What the displacement cares about is this. It is the distance between the initial and the final and it's calculated from final to initial. So if, if xf is larger than xi, then we have a positive x. It is an, a positive displacement. If x of f is smaller than x of i, then we have a negative displacement. All right, so that's one of the big notions of position, right? So this there's displacement, and it's worth noting that there's also distance, right? And we really, and I mean really, don't want to confuse displacement with distance. Distance is not displacement, right? That's what I've been trying to say for the past like, 10 seconds. Um, so it's very important to recognize the difference between these two. Distance is the length of a path followed by a particle. Distance. Length of the path followed by a particle. In that sense, um, displacement is very different from distance. Whereas distance would consider the change of, well, basically how how far the object has just the, le the very the, just the length of the path followed by the particle, meaning considering all of the ups and downs. The displacement only cares about the, the final position with regard regards to the initial position, right? So an example, it could be that, let me, let me give you a good example where distance and displacement are clearly shown to be different. If we have
this. So Timmy's walking from x is equal to 2 to x is equal to 7, and then heads back to x is equal to 2, right? And this is his final position. His initial one is over here. Well, if we're asked to, to determine both values, the displacement and the distance, you'll see that we'll end up with two different results. The displacement can be calculated with that formula, xf minus x initial. And because in both scenarios, in, in at both the final and initial position, we, st we have two meters, we end up with zero meters of displacement, right? On the other hand, the just distance, which we denote with d, will not be zero. Distance will consider the fact that um, just so seven minus two, five meters were traveled in this initial bit, and then five meters were again traveled in this little bit. So five meters over here, and then five meters over here, even though it's in the negative, in the negative direction. Oh my God. Fuck. Even though it's in the negative direction. Fuck, I don't want to do all this motherfucking edit. Okay. So, D versus X and backwards. Okay. On the other hand, on the other hand, distance considers the five meters that have been traveled, one going up, well, basically in the positive x direction, and then the five meters when Timmy was going in the negative x direction. Therefore, it is five meters plus five meters, which gives us a total distance traveled of 10 meters, right? And so that's that's pretty much it. Um, it. It's worth noting that distance can only be positive, can only be positive. You can't travel a negative distance. However, you can travel a negative displacement. Well, not travel a negative displacement. You can have a negative displacement, both negative and positive. There we go. That's a very important distinction we will have to make, right? And now we are going to move on to the next topic, which is actually very related to position. It's velocity. I'm going to go a little bit quicker over this. Right. So velocity, what is its definition? Velocity is the rate of change of position. For those who have taken calculus, you'll know this, that this is a very specific way of, of defining velocity, right? So um, we're going to see how calculus can actually play in physics, and it's going gonna, gonna, gonna to play a lot in physics. So that's why we recommend um, students take physics along with calculus or take calculus before taking physics, because a lot of things won't be properly understood if they have not yet taken physics. Um, first, we're going to go over average velocity. Average velocity. Right? So, um, average velocity is denoted as such. Velocity V of average is equal to delta x over delta t. 
we're going to use this formula quite a lot. Um, and we, this, the way that we write this is, so this is basically the displacement divided by the time interval during which that displacement occurs. And this can either be positive or negative. Oh, let's not drop that. Based, based on the sine of delta x. Right? So that's actually a very important, um, very important detail. Velocity can be negative, and generally we, we, we mix and match velocity and speed like they're the same thing, but we're going to realize that in the next few minutes we're going to see how velocity is not the same thing as speed. They're very, rela they're very relatable, but not exactly the same thing. V the average velocity can be negative, right, and it can be positive, and negative velocity is similar to to positive velocity. If we have the same, if we have negative five meters per second, and then we have five meters per second, these are very similar velocities, or let's call these average velocities, right? They're very similar. However, the sign is different. And what does this mean, actually? It means that the car that we're talking about, I guess, let's say we're talking about a car, If it's along a you have an instrument to calculate to measure what position it is if it's heading in a negative um, well if the displacement the total displacement right the difference between the final position and the initial position is negative then the average velocity will be negative, right? And negative will probably just signifies that we're heading in the negative x direction. If it, the number is positive, then we're dealing with a positive x direction, right? That's very important to pinpoint. Um, all right, we have that understood. And if we look at a position versus velo position versus time graph, we can put this definition to use. Say we have something like this. And we're trying to find the average velocity between these two points. Between T i and T f. Well, the way that we when we calculate the average velocity, we're basically considering both these points and we're drawing a line between them. Calculating the slope of this will give us the average velocity. And you can notice that by taking a look at this equation. This equation is the change of, let's say, y over the change of x, if this was like regular math, right? except for we're dealing with x for position and time, right? So it's basically the slope of these, between these two points. It's not, as you can see, there is other stuff above it, right? There is the, the graph continues despite this, this line. However, we're just trying to discuss the average velocity between these two points and thus, we don't, we don't need to care about the rest over here. We're just trying to find the change in x and then trying to find the change in y, and then dividing one by the other. And that gives us the average velocity. Next is the average speed, right? So I spoke about this earlier. I said we were going to talk about this, and here we are. Average speed is very, very similar, though the way that we denote it is like this. Average speed is equal to d over delta t. So it's the distance covered divided by 
the interval of time over which that distance has been covered, right? So the total distance traveled divided by the total time interval required to travel that distance. The average speed has no direction and is always expressed as a positive number. Oh, and it's worth, yeah. So um, average speed has no direction is always expressed as a positive number. So because it, is, it has no direction, it has no direction because of this distance. It's just, this is just a scalar, a number, right? Um, say we travel a total, say in that situation here, over, in that same situation we were dealing with before. Say in between, so what we ended up doing before is what we, cal is we calculated the displacement, which is this. But the average speed would consider the entire distance covered divided by time. And that's how we differentiate velo average velocity from average speed. It's, um, and also it's worth knowing that this number can only be positive because this can only be positive. All right. Um, next is a, one of the most important, one of the more important forms of velocity, which is instantaneous velocity. Let me erase that. Instantaneous velocity. There are a number of ways that we can write this, right? Um, and we're going to start using calculus here. It's the limit as delta t, my bad. Delta t approaches zero for delta x over delta t. So this part of the equation is the same as for the average velocity. However, because we take the limit, we are dealing with a derivative. So um, what this tells us is that the derivative of the of the posi uh, position function, right? If we take the derivative of this, either by placing that over there or by doing dx over dt, we obtain v in both situations, which is the instantaneous velocity. And what that means is so if we have a, a graph, let me try this really quick. If we have a graph like this, and we're trying to find the instantaneous velocity at this point, t, ti, then we're gonna pinpoint point across the point on the actual graph. And then we're gonna try and trace a tangent to the graph. That will give us the slope of the graph at that point, and thus will give us the instantaneous velocity. At that point, what is the velocity of an object, right? Oh, and my bad, this is x and t, right? And if you dig a little bit deeper, you'll actually realize that this does not only apply for like singular points. If we have a, a function, right? As I actually already wrote it here, but if we have a function like this, like on a graph, if we have say something like this, very simple, let's call this y is equal to, let's call this, um, x of t is equal to 4t, right? Okay, well then if we're trying to find the graph of the velocity with respect to time, meters per second and seconds, 
then we're actually going to just take the derivative. The derivative of this is 4, and thus we have a constant function for v, right? So we know that v of t is equal to 4. And this is very helpful. And this makes sense if you think about it. An object is moving at a rhythm of, so every four meters, one second passes. That's what that is basically saying. I don't even have to write the seconds. Every four meters, one second. No, we travel four meters every second. Four meters per second. That's the speed. And it does not change at any place here. See? 8 to 2. That's a continuous slope. The slope is always the same, no matter how far we go. Basic, and that's why the here, too, the slope is the same, and the function is just constant. It's just always equal to 4. And that helps us quite a lot. It's going to, that's going to come a lot in, in use. We're going to use that a lot in the class. Um, let's think about... Yes, it's worth noting that if we have positive slope, then we're going to have a positive, um, a positive instantaneous velocity at any point. If we have a negative slope, we're going to have a negative instantaneous velocity at any point. Um, and if we have a slope that is constant in the x, x versus time, the position versus time graph then we're going to have a slope of zero. So thus, a instantaneous velocity of zero at any point along the graph, right? So um, that's pretty much it. And if we think about this a little bit, if this is the derivative of that, then the integral of this function is actually the distance covered by this function, right? And let's let's think about this a little bit, right? If we have, if, if the function were to change a little bit and maybe drop like this, then this function would also drop, right? So it's gonna continue and then here the slope is zero. It's gonna go like this, like that-ish, and it's gonna turn out to be negative, like that, right? So we realize that this, oh. that is the displacement. So basically, the slope, uh, basically the integral, oh.
this thing to come. Please change your position. All right, so moving on, um, it's worth noting that the area underneath the velocity graph is in fact the displacement, right? Okay, that's worth noting as well. Um, okay, next we're gonna go over quickly the instantaneous speed, which is the magnitude instantaneous speed all right it is the the definition of it is the magnitude of the instantaneous velocity of a particle at a point in time. And this is going to make a little bit more sense when we start chapter 3, but for now we're going to have to deal with it. Um, so basically, an example could be that, okay, so say we have um, a particle with negative 25 meters per second as a velocity. And that's possible because velocities can be negative. Speeds cannot be negative. Um, so basically, we're going to go over this in chapter 3, but this, this is a vector, right? It's a quantity which has a sign. And the sign is basically saying that it's going in the opposite direction, the, the opposite negative, the opposite x direction, right? 
So the magnitude of this is the number, right? And that's the speed. That's what we're defining is magnitude. Mm -hmm. So therefore the speed of something moving with a velocity of negative 25 meters per second is 25 meters per second. As simple as that. It's basically the, yeah, it's just the magnitude of the vector. And we're gonna go over that very shortly. It will start to make sense. Mm -hmm. All right, now we're gonna start going over acceleration. Okay. Acceleration, the velocity of velocity, kind of. <laughs> Acceleration. Okay, so this is basically the rate of change of velocity. And just like velocity, we can define it as, we can use acceleration as average acceleration. Sometimes we're going to ask for that value. And sometimes we're going to look for instantaneous acceleration. And for the most part of this class, we're going to be dealing with constant acceleration. Okay. So average acceleration, just as the other, just like the other, definitions. I kind of screwed that up. Just like the other definitions of like just like the other average um, just like the other just like the average velocity is the delta v delta velocity change in velocity over the change in time over that. Yeah, exactly. So and that's pretty much it. It's rather simple. The units of acceleration are meters per squared meters per second squared and so yeah we can, just as we did before we can interpret average acceleration as like if we have a graph like this it's cutting the graph to connect two dots this being ti this being tf right and then we end up with a change of velocity and a change of no no okay I had one last night it's okay huh? I had one last night thank you mama a change of a change of pi ah. yeah so basically it's the change of velocity over the change of time we can also define acceleration as instantaneous acceleration under in which circumstances we would be taking the limit of delta t heading towards zero of delta v over delta t which gives us delta v dv over dt something that we can familiarize ourselves with if you've taken calculus all right and now we're going to be dealing with a slightly like I would say weird we're gonna have to create new intuition right and let me explain what I mean by that acceleration is the rate at which velocity changes if we say something is accelerating it means that the velocity the change of velocity is positive right that means that we are, well, actually, let me, let me explain this in another way. There, there's positive acceleration when the velocity increases with time. When the velocity increases with delta t, and then there's negative a when v decreases with delta t. 
right? And so the acceleration of an object is positive if its direction is the same as that of the direction of the motion of the object. All right, and that might sound a little bit difficult to digest, but let me, let me phrase it in a different way, a little bit easier. Basically, if we have a car, some driving, and it's moving in this direction, this is its motion, and if the acceleration is in the opposite direction, then this is called, this is negative acceleration the acceleration is causing the car to reduce its speed reducing its speed with respect to time therefore this is deceleration negative if the acceleration is pointing in the same direction as the motion well then the car will be accelerating right and that's pretty much it even if the car would be backing up As long as the acceleration and the motion are in the same direction, that would be considered positive acceleration. And that also depends on the coordinate system that we're working with, of course. And so going back to instantaneous acceleration, if we have a graph of V over T, taking the tangent at a point at a point can help us taking the tangent of a, of a point will show us the slope of that point and that slope is the instantaneous acceleration and that's pretty much it just as dv over dt just as dx over dt is velocity we have dv over dt, which is acceleration. And thus, we can, we know that d, the double derivative of position with respect to t is equal to the derivative of velocity with respect to t, which is equal to a, acceleration. There we go. And now we're finally going to make our way to some practice problems. All right. So finally, just further our understanding of acceleration. Just to make sure that we really understand what is going on. A practice problem. the position of an object is described by x of t is equal to e, I've got a little function over here, minus 2t, okay. When is the velocity zero? Okay, so the position of an object is described by that function. When is the velocity zero? So, hmm, that's a little bit, it feels a little bit tricky. The velocity, we only have the position function. What relationship do we have between the position function and the velocity function that can help us find out when v is equal to zero. Well, we should know that dx over dt is equal to v. Therefore, if we find the derivative of this, we can find the answer. So we go ahead and do that. So we are going to be doing the product rule. So negative add e to the negative 2 over t over t times t plus 2t 
which I'm worried of losing space. Um, plus e to the negative t over two, plus, not plus, times two t minus two. Okay, right? Is that everything? Yeah, I think that is. So then we do, we, we can simplify this as A second yeah we don't okay so here so we have the we have I haven't fully finished simplifying but we have to come to a certain understanding we're trying to find the moment when this is equal to zero this will be equal to zero only if this part is equal to zero because this will never be equal to zero and a multiplication will only be equal to zero if one side one one prod one of the the parts of the multiplication is equal to zero and this cannot be equal to zero as it is an exponent e to the something will never be equal to zero the smallest it become it can become is very close to zero but never flat out zero um so here we can just single this out and simplify while we're at it to minus plus t plus 2t minus 2 is equal to negative t over 2 plus 3t minus 2 is equal to 0. And now we use the quadratic equation to find our final times. I'm going to use my calculator. Negative 1 divided by 2 negative one half, three, negative two, and we get an answer of, we obtain two, we get two answers actually. T is about equal to 5.236679, we'll trim the last few decimals, or 0 0.7, and this is in seconds, 0 0.76, three nine three two seconds okay but now what do we do hmm this is interesting we have two results is one correct or is the other correct no actually both are correct these are two times during which the velocity will be equal to zero so we find our answer both of these t1 and t2 all right let's go on to the next question Question's asking, saying that the velocity, the velocity of a particle is described by v of t, the velocity function is equal to negative t squared plus 10t. Period. Question A is asking, what is the position of the particle at t is equal to 12 seconds? Well, hmm, what, what can we do here? We know that the velocity is the derivative of x with respect to t, right? Or at least the instantaneous velocity. And that's what this is described in that equation. But what is, how can we find the position from that point? Well, if you think about it for a little, the displacement of a, I'm sorry, yeah, the, the, the displacement 
of the displacement of a situation or of like an object with respect to time is the, or just like the displacement in a situ given situation is equal to the integral of the function of the velocity. So that's all we have to do. We just find the integral described by, okay. We basically find the integral of that, negative two squared plus to the t. Is this correct? Yeah, this is correct. dt is equal to negative t3 over 3 plus 5 t squared plus c. OK. And it's asking for the answer. It's asking for the position of the particle at time 12. And I'm sorry, it's, you can only find, you find the displacement if you mention the limits of integration, 0 through 12. So this would not be the answer. This would only be part of the answer. There would be no C. We have, we're actually going to input this in a calculator because 12 to the 3 is not a very easy calculation. 12 to the 3 mm, divided by 3 Okay, plus 5 times 12 squared equals to 144 meters, which is great. It is worth noting that if you just took the derivative, the indefinite integral, the indefinite integral, you would obtain just the function of the position. Whereas if you take the definite integral, you obtain the displacement of like this the, the, the situation, right? And so here, by doing the definite integral, we obtain the displacement, which is all we needed, because we just want to find out the end point. We want to find out how, like what's the, the result of all the zigzags. We don't care about the zigzags. We care about the beginning and the end. And this tells us that after 12 seconds, we are at 144 meters. Now let's move on to question two, question part B of this question. I believe it's asking for speed, the total distance. Yeah, and that's correct. That, that, that is the question. What is the total distance traveled by the particle at t is equal to 12 seconds. Well, total distance is not displacement. Let's again remember that distance is not equal to displacement. Thus, we can't use what we just used in the last Question. We can't just find the integral. That would only give us the displacement. Um, what we would need to do for this situation is actually break down... Well, I, as I, I didn't mention this before, but it's worth noting that the absolute value of the velocity equation is equal to speed. Well, as in, this is the speed equation. And the integral of the speed equation, that, my friends, is the total distance. So, yeah, like this. Just want to make sure I don't make any mistakes for you guys. All right, this. So what we're doing. However, it's not quite easy, right? It, you might be like, what do I do? What is this? How do I take the integral of the absolute value? That's, that seems unreasonable. Well, maybe it sounds unreasonable, but that's because you have to think about it in a different way. You have to decompose 
the absolute value of b, the speed equation. All right, so k like this, negative plus 10t for zero, the root of t is more than 10, right? So if by finding, okay, I guess maybe Okay, so If we were to graph This Let's try it Zero as a point at zero, zero At t is equal to one We have negative one, nine It's nine And then at Two t goes equal to two. So you have negative four twenty. Negative four and twenty would give like sixteen. Um let's see. Five fifty. Huh. Well at some point let's see negative one. Hmm. At ne if we input negative one we would actually get negative 11. Interesting. I'm guessing the function looks a little bit like that. Does it? The fuck? But anyways, we want only the positive values. So that's what's and what's that's what's that's what it's going to look like. We want the integral only when the 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 function is above um, y is equal to zero, or in this case v is equal to zero. So that's what we're doing. We're finding this point and this point, which is ten, right? That's why I wrote that here. We're saying the function can remain as is between these two values. However, when it's smaller or larger or actually not we're not going to consider smaller than this is irrelevant to us because t cannot be equal to a negative value right so time can't be negative therefore we're only going to treat we're only going to take we're only going to consider these values and further on so here we do this we multiply the equation times negative, uh, times negative one, for t is larger or equal to 10. That should be correct. And small, oh, and it's until 12. That's another boundary worth noting. So it's from 10, smaller equal to t, um, smaller equal to 12. All right, well, actually smaller than. So basically we have this now, and trying to take the integral of this is quite simple actually. We just do this. We break it down. Zero through 10 of negative two plus 10 t dt plus 10 through 12 of t squared minus and t dt and after calculating this i won't go through that trouble right now um you'll find out that the answer is 89.3 periodic and this is in meters this is the total distance covered in that time and so if we compare the two the last the, the answer of a to the answer of b we'll notice that t was actually larger which makes sense it'll always be larger or equal to the the displacement as it can't be there can't be any subtractions in calculating this it's always going to be an addition of a length either you stop or you continue going and if you continue going you're going to increase the distance traveled however the distance 
the displacement can be negative, right? So you can subtract values to it. If you go in one direction and they start going in the opposite direction, then you're going to subtract your displacement. All right, thanks so much for watching, guys. Next video, we're going to go over the kinematic equations of chapter two. So see you guys there.